Hey, good morning. It is so good to worship the Lord again together. Uh, hey, I'm not in the church, but I'm as close as I can possibly be to be in the building. I'm here on campus today and coming at you. We're just another step away from actually being in the building. But hey, until then, we're going to continue to worship virtually. I miss you so much. I came up here this week in part to serve alongside many of you, volunteers and others, collecting sandwiches and all kinds of things for our, uh, our, our people, you know, partners in, in mission uh, in the city. It's so good to, to just see people and to be together. But until then, again, we're virtual. We've all come to understand what that means, not in the flesh, right? We've had virtual Zoom groups. I was with another group uh, this week, a group of men that I love so much, but just want to be with. Uh, but way to go. We've got record numbers uh, in our Zoom groups, but we're not really together, are we? Uh, it, it's crazy. We I, I just talked to one of our students, finishing school virtually, right? Online. We just honored our graduates. We're having to do that virtually. You know, virtual literally means uh, almost, not according to strict definition, but close, but not. And that's what we're experiencing these days. Of course, we've come to understand virtual means this, right? I'm coming at you via technology. I'm not in person, but so much of life is really meant to be lived out in person, in the flesh. Like this, like worshiping together is to be done in person. You know, some of you know the old uh, finger play where you, and we can all do this together. You know, here's the church, do this. So here's the church, right? Here's the steeple, do that. And you kids can do this. Open the door, there's the door. Open the door, here's all the people, right? There's the people. Did you know there's a second part of that? There's a second verse. It goes like this. I didn't know this. Um, open the door. No, close the door. That's it. Hear them pray, open the door, they all walk away. How about that? They all scatter. We talk about this often. Scattered, right? We gather to scatter, but now we're longing to gather the scattered church. But until then, we'll continue to do what we're doing here. And we've noted through phases how we're going to get there. Stay in touch every week as we'll update you along the way. I've heard a lot of people in the media or in, in government kind of city leaders talking about how, how Christians just want to be, it seems like they think Christians just want to be in the church. Like that's the goal. We got to get the Christians, seemingly they want to be in the church. Listen, it's not a sacred space we want to be in. That's not the point. It's a people we want to be with. Those are two very different things. The church is a people. We've talked about that a lot. I mean, for years, the church is a people. It's not a place. Jesus said, you're, gonna, you're not going to worship me on this mountain or in that temple or in that place. It's spirit and truth. There's only one kind of, of worship, acceptable worship to God. Two types of worship, unacceptable, acceptable. But we do it in person and we're able to do that. We're able to to worship the Lord right where you are, to listen to our sermons. But listen, it's so much better to be the church together. We can't wait to be together. But you know, when we uh, gather virtually like this, we can worship the Lord together. And it's not a bad way to start. If you're, if you're visiting with us, guests today, peering in, uh, hey, that's fantastic. We love it. And it's a great way for us to connect right now. But here's what I want you to learn today. And I want you to see this in our, in our passage today, uh, that Jesus, look at this, he doesn't love you virtually, all right? He doesn't love you from a distance, from social distance, a spiritual distance. He loves us. God loves you up close and personal. And this is what I want us to see today. We're back in our series that we've entitled Identity. Because here's what's so incredible. As we think about answering this question post-Easter, so what? Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was raised again, uh, the greatest miracle of all, his resurrection. But now, so what? How does that impact my life every single day? Well, for those of us who know Jesus, we'd say it impacts everything about our lives. So deep and so central is this truth. It's, it's the essence of the Christian life. And it's this, your identity, my identity is not achieved, it's received. My identity is not earned, it's given. So central to this. Uh, because, because it's only in Christ that this is the case, right? Everybody's trying to find their identity. Everybody's working towards, uh, trying to achieve a certain identity. 
I mean, it's what branding is all about, right? For a company, you got a certain identity. We see this now on social media. Everybody's trying to achieve a certain brand. I want to be that person. No, no, no. I want to be that person. We're all trying to achieve a certain identity. Well, so central to this uh, as, as a Christian, we've even gone, you know, taken deep dive into it. We have, we have fancy words like propitiation, regeneration, justification. Today, I'm going to talk about reconciliation because this is such a deep and central truth that we've got to understand it fully. Today, we're going to talk about reconciliation. And, and listen, to my graduates out there, this is true for all of us. If you listen to this message and apply it, this will change your life. I wish I knew what I'm going to share with you today uh, when, when I graduate from high school. So listen in closely and apply this message. It will change your life. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5. I referenced it earlier in our service as we launched into our worship time. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. It starts like this, verse 14. Again, grab a Bible, grab your real Bible. I'll get to the main text, but it starts like this. Verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Some translations say compels us because we have concluded this. Here's what we've come to. That one has died for all, therefore all have died. Now you might say, wait, wait, wait. I get it. Christ died, but now we all have died. This is what Paul is talking about. It's not a metaphor for him. He's saying, I had a former life. I've died to that. No longer do I live that way. Then he says in verse 15, and he died, okay, Christ died for all. Everybody say all, okay, all. He died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Okay, here's what he's saying. Just like we, okay, we have died. If we've received Christ, he's our savior, he's Lord, master of our life. We died, but we're raised again. So we've got this new life. We have a new rule of life. He says it's his love that controls us, that compels us in everything we do. He's basically saying, I don't live like that anymore. I now am living for him. So I don't have to, watch this, I don't have to forge or fight for a new identity. It's given to me, okay? I don't have to seek to achieve an identity. I receive one. It's a sign to me. Friends, this is such good news. Let's get underneath this today. Because check this out. Whether you're a Christian or not, you know this is true. Uh, you're trying to achieve a certain identity. You're trying to earn your way there. And if you're living for yourself, Paul is saying that life is self-destructive. We all know this. Given over to myself, okay, it's what the Bible calls sin. It's self-destructive. And he's saying, I don't live for myself anymore. I live for him. And that's what this whole passage is about. We've been reconciled. We've been reconciled because of Christ. And we've been reconciled so that we too can be reconcilers. All right. That's where this heads. Look at verse 16. From now on, here it is. I wonder if you can say this. From now on, therefore, because of all that, we regard no one according to the flesh. Now, what does that mean? We'll talk about it. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Now, this is more than just a personal from now on. What he's saying, the language here is such that he's saying something cosmic has happened. The death and resurrection of Christ has changed everything. Now we see everyone and everything in relation to Jesus. That's what this means. We don't see people according to the flesh. What's that mean? We don't measure people according to the flesh, which means... You know, we, we don't measure people, assess people uh, because of, you know, their good looks or someone who's rich or, or powerful or athletic or they got a great job. They got a great body. They got a great house or whatever. And he says, we don't measure people that way and never again. If you're in Christ, we see everything differently. This is amazing. Imagine if, if life really was that way. If everyone saw one another through the lens of Jesus Christ. And yet, that is exactly the way we're called to live our lives. It's changed by Christ. We see everyone differently. What if everybody lived that way? Well, hey, watch this. In the church, in the body of Christ, that's how we see each other. It's why when people show up, they go, man, look at how they love each other. They're going to know we belong to him by the way we love. 
So when we come together, I'm not judged by how much money I have, the color of my skin. I'm not judged by that. I'm, I'm equal. That's what's cool. Everyone's equal. When we look at each other according to Christ, not according to the flesh. Even better, the weak are made strong. The last are the first. And yet, he says, and some of us even still see Jesus that way. What's that mean? Yeah, he's a great moral teacher. Oh, he's the best of all the spiritual teachers out. No, no. He is God in the flesh. He's the Lord of all. We don't see him according to the flesh. Not anymore. We know who he is. In verse 17 then, you might know this verse. It says, therefore, because of all this, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. You're a new creature. See, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We've joined a new order of things, a new social order. We, we see the world differently. One commentator put it this way. Paul's words were like this. You can see it. The past was dead to him, as dead as Christ on his cross. All its ideals, all its hopes, all its ambitions were dead in Christ. He was another man in another universe. See, it's comparatively, I used to live in a virtual world. Now I'm in a real world. This is the realest world that I can live in. This is the realest love that I can experience. Look at verse 18. All this is from God. Again, you can say it again. Everybody say all. All of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us. Here it is to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We'll get to that latter part in a moment. Look at this. All of this is from God. That's what he's saying. This is one-way love. We've done nothing to gain this kind of love or achieve this new identity. So here's the first thing I want you to see. I am reconciled. Can you say that of yourself? I am reconciled. You see, just uh, as, as uh, Christ has, has reconciled me to God, I'm now going to be able to reconcile people to others. But watch, here, it's more than, more than just Oh, God has, we've ended hostilities. Like this is the DMZ with God. No, no, no. Much more than that. This is not just, well, now we're, you know, we're okay. We're good. No, this is a reuniting. This is back to the way it's supposed to be. God's not saving us from a distance or to keep us at a distance. He's not saving us virtually. Instead, he's bringing us up close and personal in relationship with him. He's the judge. But watch this. The judge hasn't just uh, you know, released us from our penalty. He's paid the price for our penalty. He's asked to come alongside close to him. He's even given us a job to do with him. We're going to talk about that in a moment. He's brought us into his home, into his family. He's given us a place to live. You see, again, this is not virtual love. This is the realest love that you can ever imagine. So this new position is current in your life and in a current reality only if you have received his grace see reconcil reconciliation demands there's two parties here one is the initiator god's done all this he's forgiven us but we have to respond to that gift and receive it look at verse 19 he says that is in christ god was re he's, he's defining it now really it's, you know spelling it out in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. Now, we, we see that. Oh, he's not counting it. Oh, good. I'm glad. He kind of looked the other way. No, no, no. He locked eyes with you and your sin. He has dealt with it. He didn't turn the other way. In fact, Jesus paid the price of his own life for us. See, the judge no longer counts our sins against us. Otherwise, we'd all be hell bound right now. And if you've not received his grace. You are, my friend. This is your day to turn to him. He, he has made a way. Uh, otherwise, you're going to just lean on what everybody else, what everybody in the world does. A behavior modification project of some sort to try to achieve this identity we're looking for. The new and improved me. Listen, not only does that not work, it is crushing in the end. So now we have this gift He's done so much more for us. Not only has he forgiven us, invited us into his family, but he's given us, watch this, we join him in this ministry of reconcil reconciliation. He says, and entrusting to us the ministry of reconciliation. This is the message of Jesus. We join him in what he's doing in the world. 
But watch this. He doesn't just kind of deputize us and say, yeah, make people feel good. Help people feel good about their relationship with me. No, no, no. He wants to affect real peace, real change in people's lives. But that happens only as we point them to Jesus. He's the one, we've already said, who's done all of this. Listen, there's only one carpenter in the world who can fix the broken heart. He's the only one. So we don't point people to ourselves. We simply point people to him, the one who is the reconciler, right? And this, this, is, this is because he is the one who's done all this. Now look at verse 20. Therefore, we get a lot of therefores here. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. All right? So I am reconciled. I'm reconciled because of Christ. And look at this. I am a reconciler. To be a Christian is to be a reconciler. That's who we now are. And look at what he says. You are an ambassador. You are a reconciler. This is the work of Jesus. So look, if you want to join God with what he's up to in the world... You become a reconciler. Have you joined him? Are you a part of what he's up to in the world? Are you? We've got to answer that question today. Are you reconciled? You're reconciled because of Christ? And are you a reconciler? Now, I want to get underneath this. I want to apply this before we close. And the way to understand this, I think, is to help us. You can look at concentric circles, okay? So there's personal relationships, personal reconciliation. That's the hardest. We're going to talk about that conflict in personal and personal rec, uh, reconciliation in relationships. Then it moves to really the church or other believers. We are to uh, you know reconcile and be united to one another. Moves to community. It's clearly in our family and into our city and into the world. So let's start at the macro level and then move in. One of the beauties of being a part of a of a big church like ours is what I've been seeing all week and throughout this pandemic, and long before. We have the opportunity to affect real change in a city. And, and even, again, in, in the world. I mean, during this pandemic, we've been able to reconcile, okay, many to God because of the challenges of our under-resourced communities that we've been serving. You see, thousands of, of sandwiches, again, have been served to people, children, who were under-resourced and in families where they would otherwise not have food to eat. And it's happening. Vickery, Cornerstone, East Dallas through Brother Bills. You see, a, a big part of being a reconciler is to address systems of injustice that divide and separate people. See, here's what I've seen. Underlying systemic injustices and inequities surface to the top during a crisis like this. Do you know that certain zip codes, I mean, there's a reason that certain zip codes are, are under-resourced and have a higher rate of unemployment. Think about that. And this is true for some of us. If your job demands that you do it in person, manual labor, if you've got to be there in person, then you've lost your job, at least for a season. Maybe you have lost your job completely. You may not know that this idea of, you know, forced to, to, to educate remotely has, has impacted school children uh, in disproportionate ways. I've learned through my friends around the city, we have 161,000, imagine this, households who don't have subscription, you know, uh, you know, broadband access. They're not online. And so you, you can imagine how this impacts. 25% of all households in Dallas don't have internet access. And 40% and, and of those are in just 10 certain zip codes. Now, there's a reason for that. There's a long history of systemic racism in large part that helps or, or has guided uh, all of these boundaries and then place people where they are today. And so those of us, we've talked about that, who are in privileged positions and places, we have an opportunity to reconcile the differences, the inequalities that we see. And what's beautiful is that our church, if we're able to live out, if we're going to live out the cultural mandate of reconciliation, we do this by facing those injustices and dealing with them. And I've seen you do that, friends. Those of us in places of leadership and influence, we have the opportunity to make a difference. Now, let's do this before I close. I, I want to talk about 
uh, personal relationships. This is where it might just be the hardest because every relationship has conflict. Every relationship. Who, who are you? you know, who's not in conflict right now? Just raise your hand. Now, this is where this gets awkward. All right. Right there where you are in your home. Uh, this is and this is the beauty of, of discipling, as we always do, in the home, watching this together. You may be in conflict with someone in your family right now. I want to guide you in this. Uh, if you're if you're not in conflict right now with someone, uh, you know, either watch this. You're either not doing much. You don't you don't have any friends. OK, because there's always conflict. Maybe you're not involved closely with people. Maybe you like that. Right. This social distancing. You're like, I don't want people up in my junk. Right. Some of us are that way. I have this quote in, in my office. It says this to avoid conflict. Say nothing. Do nothing. All right. Be nothing. So we're all going to be in conflict. But here's what Jesus says. And and, and really, Paul teaches this in Romans 12. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, as we grow in Christ, we're able to reconcile with others, right? We're going to enter into conflict and we're able to live in peaceable ways with one another, but only with great effort. I want to talk about steps, okay, towards reconciliation in relationships. The first step is to own your part, all right? So hang with me. We're going to close with this very important application. Own your part, okay? I want you to think about someone maybe you're in conflict with, all right? Now, most of us are going to respond to say, Jeff, this is not my problem. This is their problem. Okay, wait, wait. First, humble yourself, okay? Well, okay. Um, it's like 10% maybe my, my problem. Okay, they're the problem, 90%. Okay, own your 10%. That's what I'm saying. And it's probably more than that. Own your 10%, all right? Because Jesus says this, you hypocrite, Matthew 5. Here's where he says it. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now watch this. To see speck in someone's eye, you got to get up close and personal. This is not social distancing. This is not distance, virtual relationships. This is real. And, and for those who see a speck in your eye, they're calling it out. He says, you know, you make sure you see it. We need others in our, in our lives to help us see those specks in our eyes. But he says, deal with your own stuff first. Deal with your own stuff before you get to, to pointing out everybody else's problems. But here's the thing. If somebody is not so close to see a speck in your eye and they're calling you out from a distance, hey, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Listen to people who are up close and know you well and, and who love you. But look at your own junk and own your own stuff first. All right. Second is confess your sin. All right. But, you know, but Jeff, no, they I mean, that's always our attitude, right? No, but they, no, no, no. We don't regard anyone according to the flesh. Only see through the lens of Jesus. See, here's the thing. If I've been done wrong, I can say, you know what? I've been forgiven. I, I, I can forgive. So I'm going to forgive you. So confess what you've done wrong. I mean, say it out loud. I hurt you. I'm sorry. Let's own our stuff. That's how we bridge the gap in reconciliation. And then the next step, acknowledge the hurt. Uh, that's, that's to say, I've hurt you. I've wounded you in this way. And be specific in this way. See, again, during this pandemic, with this undercurrent of loss and frustration, we've probably said some things we didn't mean to say or wouldn't normally say. We're all tired of this. We're all frustration, str frustrated. But listen, if you're inclined to, to, you know, to dump your junk on other people because you're just frustrated internally, be aware of that. And if you've hurt someone, maybe even today's a good day to say, hey, I've not been, I've not been patient. I've not been kind. I've not been loving. And I'm sorry. Here's what I've said. I know I've been like this. I said this. Let's be specific. Reconcile relationship. Here's the next step. Accept the consequences. The point is this. Reconciliation doesn't mean you go back to the relationship as it was necessarily. It, it has had impact on you. You've hurt me. I'm not sure I can trust you. That takes some time, right? And if it's an abusive type relationship, you need to separate. You need to be away from that. And, and here's the next step. Alter your behavior. Now, this is so critical. This proves that you're serious about the words that you're offering. I'm sorry that I did this. I can't tell you how many. It happens with men and women. How many women I've talked to in particular. 
who say, hey, my, my husband says he has, he's confessed his sin to me and he's going to be different. I mean, he said so. He was even crying a little bit. You know, he, I mean, he's serious. No, listen, not until he acts, not until she acts on what she says she's going to do if she's hurt you. That's the only way that you can prove to someone that you're serious about your own sin. All right. So not until your actions align with what you're saying. We accept our consequences, but we alter our behavior. All right. So here's where we're going to land on my life verse. Second Corinthians 521 is how this passage ends. And it says this for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is amazing. Listen, friend, this is, this is the most amazing truth I've ever learned in my life. I am now totally forgiven, completely loved by him. This is my identity. This is who I am. Even when I don't really think I am or don't feel like I am. In him, I am covered in his righteousness. I've become the righteousness of God. What is that? It's the perfection, the justice of God. I now have a right relationship with him. That's who I am. And friend, if you've accepted Christ, that's who you are. So can you say it today? I am reconciled. I am reconciled because of Jesus. And then thirdly, I'm a reconciler. Is that who you are? If you can't say that today, I want you to know that you can receive his grace. And I'm going to close the service in this way. I want you to just bow your head with me right now, just right where you are. When there's nothing, nothing weird is going to happen, but just focus before the Lord. Do you know him? Have you received his grace? And if you haven't, friend, if you don't know that you know for sure that you've received Christ, he has come to you. He died on the cross for your sin. Stop trying to achieve your new identity. You'll never get there. Only he can give you a new life, make you a new person, a new creation, and to become a reconciler. Receive him now by faith. Lord, come into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And then for others of us, all of us, if you, you want to be a reconciler, just turn to him, give him your life, and say, I want to be reconciled in all of my relationships. And now make steps to do that this week. Start today. Now, friend, if you prayed this prayer today, I want you to do this. I want you to text, text the word Jesus, okay? Because we want to help you. We want to pray with you. You can do that right now. Let us know what Christ is doing, what the Lord by His Spirit has done in your life. And here's what we're going to do now. We're going to close our time in prayer because He's worthy. Don't you feel it through this passage? Don't you sense it? Let's just respond to Him because He has reconciled us to God so that we can worship Him. He's worthy. He alone is worthy of every breath we breathe. Let's build our lives on Him. The love that He's given to us in Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Let's worship Him now.